you sharing the screen to take over and talk to us about uh, more problem fractures. All right, thanks, Dr. Uh, Pat. Thanks, Dr. Braswell, for a great talk. So I'll be talking about disarradius fracture malunions, um, just an update on the current literature. Still have no disclosures, but I'm working on it. Um, so a couple cases to start. So a 25-year-old um, status post of fall with a distal radius fracture treated in a cast. Had the malunion, you can see down at the bottom left there, a uh, little bit of shortening. Um, he's ulnar positive. He's got some dorsal angulation or dorsal tilt. He's got decreased wrist flexion, pronation, and persistent ulnar-sided wrist pain. Then we have a 73-year-old woman who has a similar injury, also treated in the cast, similar x-rays, similar exam. And the question is, how would you treat these two patients? So here's an outline of the talk for today. Disarrays fractures, common to everybody on the call. We know that they're, they happen to a lot of patients. And the most common complication is going to be malunion. That's going to be higher with your cast immobilization as your treatment. When we talk about the distal radius anatomy, there are three articulations of the distal radius, the scaphoid and lunate facets, primarily functioning for load bearing, and then the sigmoid notch, um, which makes up the DRUJ um, for your forearm rotation. When we talk about the DRUJ, um, we know that the radius rotates around the ulna, um, and you can see the sigmoid notch does not look like a stable joint inherently, so there are a lot of soft tissue stabilizers to uh, help allow for that forearm rotation. So the TFCC, um, which we've all heard of, um, specifically the deep radial ulnar ligaments, uh, dorsal and volar, those help with uh, stability. And then for today, I want everybody to think about the distal oblique band of the interosseous membrane, which inserts right at the proximal most point of the sigmoid notch. Um, there are other extrinsic stabilizers, but they're gonna be less important for our discussions today. When we look at distal radius imaging, I think everybody's heard about the normal parameters of the distal radius. You wanna have your volar tilt, your radial inclination, your radial height. Um, ulnar variance, so normal is about one millimeter of ulnar negative variance. Then you, when you're getting x-rays for your distal radius, you're gonna get your PA, your oblique, your lateral, and your 10 degree lateral, which allows you to see your lunate facet on profile, as well as the teardrops, your volar ulnar corner. In terms of measuring ulnar variance, um, it's been described multiple different ways in the literature, but one way is to just look where is the distance, the midpoint between your dorsal and your volar ulnar corners and use that as a central reference point. When it comes to distal radius fractures, um, there are multiple types. Extraarticular is pretty self-explanatory. Um, intraarticular fractures, on the other hand, there are usually five different intraarticular fragments that you can see that have been described. So your dorsal ulnar corner, your volar ulnar corner, your dorsal wall, an intraarticular fragment kind of for your die punch, and then your radial column, including the styloid and your scaphoid facet. And if you're really discerning, you can actually make out all these different fragments on your plane films. Um, so when you do have a patient that comes in with a distal radius fracture, you want to be discerning, take a look at your x-rays, try to identify each fragment. You want to look at your normal parameters, see if you have any dorsal tilt, as this patient does. Um, look at your radial inclination and height, your ulnar variance. But there are also other parameters that we don't talk about as much that I wanted to point out. So on your lateral, you want to look at the A to P distance of the distal radius. So if this is widened, then widened would be essentially wider than your, the width of your lunate, as you can see here. Um, that's indicative of an intraarticular fracture. Um, this can be subtle, but it's not as subtle in the patient that you see on the bottom right there. Another thing to look at is the teardrop angle. So usually it's about 70 degrees. You measure this by taking the angle between the longitudinal axis of your radial shaft and align through the, uh, your teardrop. And so that can be increased as you see on the top right where you see the entire carpus has shifted volarly, or it can be depressed as you see on the bottom right where the entire carpus has actually shifted dorsally. Other things to look at on your lateral, you can look at the radius of curvature of your distal radius as well as the articular cavity depth, which should be about two mil or within two millimeters of the contralateral side. So here you can see it's about eight millimeters compared to five millimeters. And then finally, coronal shift. So normally on a PA of your uh, distal radius, over half of the lunate should be ulnar to the ulnarmost border of the radial shaft, as you can see here. 
Um, but with distal radius fracture, you can have shift. So you can see the radial shaft is now a little bit closer to the ulna and over half of the lunate is now radial to that ulnar border. Um, that can lead to some DRUJ instability because it causes slack in that distal oblique band of the interosseous membrane. That's better uh, visualized right here. You can see if you have a TFCC tear and coronal shift, then that distal oblique band slack gets slack in it and that causes DRUJ instability. But if you get that reduced, that'll tension that distal oblique band and in theory cause you to have um, a stable DRUJ. You can also have the opposite happen. So if you have an ulnar shaft fracture that then translates in the coronal plane, that can also cause slack in that distal uh, oblique band with an associated TFCC tear, also causing DRUJ instability. So I want to briefly touch on how malunions affect the biomechanics, um, looking at the other radiographic parameters. So decreased radial inclination, that's going to decrease the length that your flexor tendons have and decrease their mechanical advantage, causing some grip weakness. And it can also increase the load on the radial carpal joint. When we look at dorsal tilt, this is going to be the most common deformity that you see with a distal radius fracture. That can call, cause incongruency of the DRUJ. Volar tilt can do the same, um, leading to loss of pronation and supination. You can also get carpal instability with dorsal tilt. So in the top right, you can see that there's extension of the lunate, that's the adaptive DC deformity that they talk about, and then flexion of the capitate here, causing that zigzag deformity. And that can cause mid-carpal instability where that capitate actually subluxate, subluxates out the dorsal aspect of the wrist. You can also have radial carpal instability. So you can see here the distal radius in the bottom right is extended um, with that dorsal tilt, and then the entire carpus can actually subluxate out the dorsal aspect of the joint. And we look at radial shortening and ulnar positivity. This may have the greatest impact on DRUJ kinematics. So this will limit the patient's supination. But these patients often present with ulnar-sided wrist pain. Um, this will be due to a multitude of reasons, including ulnar abutment, as you can see in the top right, TFCC tears, and then symptomatic uh, ulnar styloid non-unions. Finally, these, uh, all these fractures do have deformity in the axial plane, so axial rotation. It's common, but evidence is, tells us that it probably doesn't have much of an effect on motion or functional status, so we don't worry about it as much. So with that all said, what actually defines a malunion? So there's no real standard definition. The AOS clinical practice guidelines do have suggestions for operative discussions in acute fractures, so dorsal tilt greater than 10 degrees, radial shortening, and intraarticular displacement, but they don't really define what defines a malunion. There are multiple definitions in the literature. A lot of them are very similar to these guidelines, but we should probably talk about what they actually are. And the real question is, does any of this actually matter? So we look at the early data, um, 1983, they found that dorsal tilt was associated with mid-carpal instability, like we talked about, loss of grip strength and loss of motion. In 1987, they found that patients with malunions had a poor prognosis, and this is associated with dorsal tilt greater than 20 degrees, decrease in radial inclination, and comminuted in intraarticular fractures. Looking at data from, that's a little bit more recent, find that malunion outcomes may be age dependent. So in patients less than 65 years old, dorsal tilt greater than 10 degrees, decrease in radial inclination and ulnar positivity are associated with worse outcomes, but they didn't actually see these differences in patients over 65. When we start to take a closer look at the elderly, um, multiple randomized control trials have shown us that even though elderly patients may have better radiographic uh, uh, better images with operative fixation, their radiographs don't really correlate with their function. And so the x-ray might look bad, but generally elderly people do okay. But there is some evidence that maybe the x-ray does matter. In a 2013 age-adjusted prospective cohort study with two years of follow-up, they found that the combination of ulnar positivity with dorsal tilt was worse in terms of functional outcomes than either one of those deformities individually or patients that had no malunion. So maybe those two factors matter more than anything else.
So that's a lot of information. And the question we're probably wondering is who do we treat? And you have to treat the patient. There are no absolute indications for operative intervention here. You need to consider the age, the activity, the culture, the functional status, and the physical exam of your patient. But if you have to stick a flag in the sand, then ulnar positivity and dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees may matter the most. So when we talk about treatment options, um, typically your deformity is gonna dictate what you do. Um, we'll for focus on dorsal tilt today as it's the most common deformity. Now, when you're treating dorsal tilt malunions, Typically, you're gonna do some type of radial osteotomy. You have two options, an opening wedge or a closing wedge osteotomy. But you can do the, either one of those osteotomies from a dorsal approach with a dorsal plate or a volar approach with a volar plate. And you don't have to use a plate. You might be able to use an X-fix or a nail. And then finally, you can't forget about the ulna. If the patient's ulna positive, you have to figure out, do you want to do nothing to the ulna or do you want to do something to the ulna? So starting with the opening wedge osteotomy, um, again, you can use a dorsal or a volar approach to do this. Um, briefly go over the technique here, but we won't uh, go into all the details. But you can start by putting an 18 gauge needle in the joint, as you can see here, and then use a couple of K wires as guides then you can actually fix your volar plate to the uh, distal portion of your distal radius, distal to your osteotomy first, just so you have the holes. Make your osteotomy, do your opening wedge and you can use a laminar spreader to help out. And then you place your plate and as you reduce the plate to the shaft, you can often correct your deformity. So again, doing an opening wedge osteotomy is pretty simple to do with a volar plate within most uh, orthopedic surgeons wheelhouse. They have pretty good outcomes with 80 to 95% of the motion of the contralateral side. You can correct radial shortening, and you, again, you can do it from dorsal or volar. But as you can see here, you do have a pretty large bone void dorsally when you do an opening wedge osteotomy. It may take longer time to heal, and then there's a question of do you want to use bone graft or not for that big void that you have. Um, when we look at bone graft in distal radius fracture osteotomies, especially opening wedge, Jupiter and Ring compared using cortical versus cancellous autograft, and they found no differences um, radiographically or functionally. Opal and Serene looked at opening wedge osteotomies with a volar plate with no bone graft at all, and they found no complications in 100% union. So you probably don't need bone graft despite the void that you have, especially if you use a volar locking plate. To touch on closing wedge osteotomies, oftentimes these are done in conjunction with an ulnar shortening osteotomy. You can see on the right, the kind of series of diagrams for a closing wedge osteotomy. And you can see that you have good cortical contact here. So you don't need any bone graft, which is a nice advantage. Outcomes are very similar to those for the opening wedge osteotomy. Again, you can do this from dorsal or volar. And since you have such good cortical contact, some people would suggest that you could use this for patients with osteopenia. However, you can't correct any radial shortening. And again, you need to have an, often need to have an ulnar osteotomy because you're gonna shorten the distance of the radius. So when we look at direct comparison of the opening and the closing wedge osteotomies, um, they actually have similar operative time, similar grip strength and similar dash scores. One study found that the Mayo wrist scores were better with a closing wedge and the opening wedge had longer time in the union by about a month, more secondary procedures, specifically ulnar shortening osteotomies, and a slightly worse flexion extension arc. So their conclusion was a closing wedge osteotomy with ulnar shortening is a better procedure, but the outcomes show that they're pretty similar. Wanted to compare um, the volar and the dorsal approach for these osteotomies. So a very recent study compared dorsal and volar opening and closing osteotomies, so dorsal plates and volar plates. They found no radiographic differences, but the volar osteotomy did have better motion, better quick dash scores, and a lower complication rate. So a volar approach with a volar plate and extended FCR uh, approach would allow for adequate visualization and allow you to basically do everything you need for an osteotomy here. Finally, touching on fixation types, um, we always talk about nail plate X-fix. The volar locking plate is most commonly reported at this point and has lower complication rates than the dorsal plate. 
but there are alternatives. You can see on the right, there is an intramedullary nail that has been reported for use with distal radius fracture malunion. There are also reports of orthogonal plating to correct biplanar deformities. However, you can usually correct biplanar deformities with just one volar locking plate. And then there are also reports of using the X-fix in distraction osteogenesis, um, which may be useful in cases of extreme radial shortening. And then finally, what do you want to do to the ulna? So in my opinion, if the patient has ulnar-sided wrist pain, they're ulnar positive, and there's no DRUJ arthrosis, your one option is to do an ulnar shortening osteotomy. Um, there are reports of doing this in isolation if the patient has less than 20 degrees of dorsal tilt, so just completely avoiding the radial osteotomy at all. But the patient does have greater than 20 degrees of dorsal tilt, probably prudent to combine it with a radial osteotomy. And then if the patient has DRUJ arthrosis, that's outside the scope of this talk, um, and you should probably just call a hand surgeon. In terms of intraarticular deformities, just want to touch on it briefly. Um, you want to make sure to get a CT with 3D reconstructions, and then essentially you're going to recreate all of your fracture fragments and then choose your fixation based on the needs of those fragments. But there are excellent results reported when compared to uh, osteotomies for extraarticular malunions. So it is possible. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on 3D printed guides. So this has been reported recently. Um, you get bilateral CTs to compare your wrists, and then you can have multiple guides reverse engineered with the screw holes for your plate, as well as cutting guides. So you can see here, this is a guide that you put on first, and then these are the screw holes for your shaft, and then these are the screw holes for the distal part of your plate. So you drill the holes, then you apply a guide over those K-wires and you'll have a series of cutting guides to make your osteotomies. And then the idea is that you just have to put the plate on the bone and your screw holes are already there. Um, and it kind of takes some of the work out of it. So just to conclude, um, the best treatment for a disarrhagious malunion is to just avoid the malunion in the first place. Radial shortening um, or ulnar positivity as well as dorsal tilt greater than 20 degrees are likely the most significant deformities. Remember to treat the patient, not the x-ray. Age and function do matter. And then a volar plate with opening or closing wedge osteotomy is appropriate for most deformities. And when in doubt, don't forget to shorten the ulna. I'd like to acknowledge everybody who helped me out with this talk. Here are my references and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Randy. Awesome. Uh, good stuff. Um, be, uh, let me ask you a quick question because I'm sure that this came up as you were looking through um, all this literature. Um, it's sort of a preemptive talk to how do you fix the non-union. Um, so it's a little bit off topic, but when you initially treat somebody non-operatively in a cast, you know, how do you make that, that call? And maybe some of the hand people could uh, weigh in on this too. How do you make that call at three, four weeks, when you've lost your reduction, you're, you're no longer satisfied with it, you have that feeling it's gonna go on to non-union, but at the same time, it's partially healed. Is that something that we should be acting on to prevent this sequelae? Or do you, do you let it go ahead and heal because it's already in the process? Um, you know, I'm sure that that's a uh, scenario everybody has had to deal with. So I didn't put it in just for timing wise, but um... There are multiple reports of the timing when you have a disarradius fracture um, that looks like it's going to go on to malunion. And essentially within six weeks um, is the time that you really want to get in there because then you'll still have some callus. You'll still know where you can make your osteotomy. So especially if it's dorsal tilt and it's a young person, I would say you can, it's not, you know, as easy as doing the original surgery, but it's easier than waiting, you know, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, months to actually do the osteotomy. So if it looks like it's going on to, it will be a malunion, especially with ulnar shortening or dorsal tilt, then just pull the trigger. Yeah, Josh, I'll throw one other thing out there uh, that I think is helpful. I think there's obviously patient factors that go into the, the question you're asking, what do you do at three to four weeks? It's loss reduction. I think there's the, there's kind of three scenarios. One, there's the, 
older patient who you've basically resigned that you are going to treat them not op and you tell them up front it's going to lose reduction and as it does that's okay because you're still going to function quite well despite the radiographic change then you've got the younger patient that uh, it drops off and you, it's easy because you just tell them look we've lost reduction we need to go get this taken care of and the hardest ones those are those in-betweeners you know 55 year old 58 year old uh, medium demand uh, and they've and they had a great reduction in the ER, and each week it kind of gets worse and worse. One thing that I think is really helpful is just take off the splint or the cast and just let them see their arm and look at it because some of them will look at it and say, "Oh, this is completely unacceptable. I want this taken care of," and you go right then. Others that look at it and just having that knowing up front what it's going to look like because it's harder when you wait until it's all the way done and take off the cast and like whoa i didn't realize my wrist was going to look like this so um i think i think that's really useful lois ozer actually taught me that rise i came just take off the cast and let them see what their wrist looks like and be sure that they're accepting of it then andy one um, um quick biomechanical question you know when um when we talk about some of the functional limitations of the malunion to start with you talk about the, the loss of tension on the, the tendons and the loss of mechanical um, ability because of that. Um, when you do a closing wedge osteotomy, you're necessarily shortening the bone. Um, it seems like that would have that effect as well, although I didn't really see that in the functional outcomes. Do you have any, any way of reconciling that? Why, in other words, why when we further shorten the bone with, with a closing wedge osteotomy, does that not create an additional mechanical disadvantage for the tendons? Um, in terms of the flexor tendons, I'm not sure. Um, maybe there is a mechanical disadvantage. Um, in terms of stability of the DRUJ, because you usually do that ulnar shortening osteotomy concurrently, um, I think that's what caused you to have stability at, with forearm rotation, so your pronation and your supination. Um, but I'd imagine that we just don't have sensitive enough measurements for any type of flexor tendon disadvantage. Also, mm -hmm. yeah, but I'd defer to um, the hand if they have any other comments there. Yeah, you're, you're right. We do tend to do the opening wedge uh, osteotomy, and it's typically opening it uh, dorsally because they're typically dorsally angulated. Occasionally, they have complete loss of radial inclination, and you may do a closing wedge um, on the ulnar side to restore the radial height and inclination, and you're not really changing the length uh, the flexor tendons as much uh, with that because of the the plane of the deformity that you're correcting. But, um, you know, as Randy said very nicely, and it was a really good, uh, good talk, I think these patients um, typically present in as two kind of two sets of patients. I mean, I think you either have in terms of a getting back to malunion as opposed to acute or subacute fractures. The young patients, they'll either present with a significant intraarticular malunion or significant dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees. And I think those are more kind of no-brainers to address the, the distal radius malunion by correcting those deformities. And occasionally they'll present with severe post-traumatic um, arthrosis, in which case we can consider doing a limited wrist fusion or radioscape uh, arthrodesis, still preserving some wrist motion but addressing that intraarticular uh, malunion and arthrosis. And then the second scenario is presenting with ulnar sided wrist pain. So for a young patient, again, if you address the deformity and the distal radius and that corrects the ulnar variance issue, then you don't really need to do anything with the ulna. But I'd say the second population that presents is the el more elderly or lower demand patients who really had a pretty severe um, deformity with their original fracture and they're treated uh, non-operatively, they really don't tend to present with uh, some of the things that Randy presented um, regarding the um, mid-carpal instability and loss of wrist motion and complaining of grip strength. It's really presenting with ulnar-sided wrist pain. And so I think uh, in those patients, unless they really have um, severe dorsal angulation, uh, then you really can just address the variance by doing an ulnar shortening osteotomy and they do quite well with it. But, um, you know, a, a lot of these malunions that um, have criteria radiographically, at least it exceeds kind of what's recommended in the clinical practice guidelines, they'll be very minimally symptomatic. And as Glenn said, oftentimes their chief complaint is just the appearance of, of the uh, wrist if that hasn't been addressed um, in the early management of it. Thank <laughs> you.
Any other uh, comments or questions? All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Braswell, Dr. McKnight. Excellent talks this morning. Um, some good uh, salvage uh, options for some tough fractures. Uh, everybody have a good week. We will look forward to.